Okay, thanks very much, Stefan. Thanks for your kind words and thanks for inviting me here. It's my first time in Edinburgh, so it's has been really nice and exciting. And also a great day. Like <laughs> no clouds today. I thought there would be always this low pressure area around Scotland, but it's not true. As it turns out. So I'm going to talk about virtual analog modeling, and um, I, I wonder if, if that's an interesting topic for everybody. I, I don't know, but I think it's more interesting actually than you might think if you don't know about it. It's all about like music electronics and all the interesting things, keyboards and guitars and amplifiers and things. So I'll go through some of these uh, things we have been doing uh, during the recent years. But first I'll just say a few words about where I come from. I come from Aalto University. This is a new university. Maybe some of you may not know it. Well, Stefan knows about it. He's, he's been there and Greg and some others might have been there. But but it's a, it's a new university because it was only formed in 2010 when three universities in Finland were merged. And but one of them was Helsinki University of Technology. That's where I used to study and work for many years. But now it's part of this new multidisciplinary university. And, uh, we're near Helsinki. It's not technically in Helsinki, but it's very close. And here's an aerial view. So this is our campus area. I, I work there. Helsinki is actually all that stuff, blah, or area, land on the other side. Yeah, well, water is, is Helsinki, and then Edinburgh, not visible, but over there. <laughs> not very far. And uh, oh, that's how it looks today, actually, or recently. We have less than a meter of snow, minus 10 degrees at night, and then maybe zero plus, plus two during the day, just now in, in February. Um, this is my group today. I just had to check recently, count the hits. So, so we are about 15 people in my group at the moment. I have two senior researchers, uh, Henry Pentin, if some of you know him, and also an older guy called Ola Kirkebu. Then I have two postdocs at the moment and six PhD students or researchers in the team. I also have some others who are part-time, not part of the team, but I also supervise them. And then we have always some visitors, like now I have a visitor from Italy, another from Estonia, another from Denmark, and I think next week I'll get another one from Spain. So we get a lot of these students, uh, visiting students these days, which is good actually because I, my funding Situation is not the best at the moment, but I can I can have a lot of activity anyway because I get these visitors. I'm quite happy about it. my funding sources. Well, Academy of Finland is like the Science Academy in Finland. I, this used to be the big source, but not at the moment. It's actually getting difficult to get funding for music-related research. EU is a little bit more helpful, and then we have some local uh, systems and some companies like Nokia, but it's under I like online also. Nokia at the moment is focusing on something else and not, not this type of research. But we have, there's one big company called Sandvik that is interested in working with us because they do, they are interested, well, they produce noise, they are doing rock drilling machines actually. So I'm happy that they at least are interested in us. Uh, current research topics of my team are here. So we have been doing physical modeling of sound sources, various types of sources like guitars, uh, pianos and other instruments. Also now we do those sound sources, uh, noise, noise sources, and then virtual analog modeling, which is the like, modeling of analog music, analog music technology. Also we have been doing synthesis and audio effects processing. And uh, a few years ago we started headphone audio. Headphones are of course becoming a very big thing. Uh, it's estimated that now music is more listened to through headphones more often than through speakers actually because everybody has headphones everybody uses the mobile phone as a music player and also traditionally we've done a lot of dissolved filtering research and it turns out that actually this has been probably the most important thing globally because so many people can use digital filters music technology is really for only some some people uh, on the on the planet but it looks like these soft filters are very very important for many, many applications. Uh, okay, the first topic uh, is spring reverberation. Stefan has also been working on that. He actually is one of the people who started this research field, and a simulation of spring reverberation. So spring reverbs are these little, little devices where you have these little springs and you have an actuator and, and a sensor uh, and in, at the ends of the spring and then you do like you, you feed a signal into the spring and then it's reverberated and, and you hear 
uh, processed sound. Uh, I think in the early days the idea was to make some kind of room uh, simulation or something like that, reverberant effect, but actually it's something quite, quite different. Uh, but still interesting because it's, it's much used in, in music. And um, so we have been doing some basic research also with Stefan and understood how, we, how, how the spring works. Here, this is a so-called impulse response of the, of the spring reverb, so you, it's, we measure how, what, it, what happens if you sort of hit the spring uh, with a little uh, hammer, for example. So that's, that's how it sounds. And this is the, the spectrogram of the impulse response, so here's time. 0.6 seconds, and this is uh, your frequency axis from 0 to 8 kilohertz. You can see that the, there's these kinds of chirps at low frequencies, also kind of chirps at high frequencies, and that's how those make that kind of uh, funny sound, boom, that, uh, that you hear, so the, the repeating uh, chirps. And now we have a method to, to simulate uh, or produce similar um, responses with algorithms. It, it actually goes like this. We have a, like a feedback loop and where we use a big all-pass filter. All-pass filter is a system that can uh, change the, the phases of the signal. And this, in this case, we actually do a frequency-dependent delay. And then there's a big delay line, so we do the chirp and then the signal gets becomes, you know, start to circulate in this kind of feedback loop over and over again and, and gets more and more chirpy. And uh, we also do some modulation of the, of the delay to make a kind of effect uh, like make the reflections more blurry over time. And this is one idea we have been using. It was published in the Journal of the ADS in uh, 2010. And, yeah. and uh, next show how, how these uh, old pass filters are done. Each, uh, there's actually about 100 structures like this. This is like, um, these blocks are delays, and then there's a few feedback and feedforward feed forward paths. And um, if that whole delay here inside is just one sample, we get this kind of chirp. But then, if we actually use 4.4 samples, where we do four samples here, and then this structure here, which is the first or all pass, which does the 0.4 samples of delay, we get this kind of version of the chirp. So if this is the original chirp, and there's this mirror image, another mirror image, and another mirror image, and then some extra. And if we low pass filter that, we get that chirp. And that's actually very similar to those chirps you saw earlier here. So we could do one of those chirps now, like that. And then if you put that filter in a feedback loop, you get a series of those chirps. So that's the basic of the basis of that, that algorithm. And I think I could now show you how it works in, in practice. So I have here a little application uh, which plays drums through a, sp a spring reverb simulation. So delay now. So now no, no processing. And these uh, parameters here are like uh, decay rate and then uh, like um, repetition rate of the, of the pulses and then like the cut frequencies all that. What frequency the chirps end. In, in, in uh, so I'll, I'll show you. I'll just play with the parameters a little bit, so you 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 hear what it what it does. So it's, it's pretty nice and it, it works in real time now, so without any little audio processing uh, algorithm or plugin. Uh, next, I, I could talk about uh, guitar pickups. This is a topic that we recently uh, worked on. So the, the guitar pickup, of course, is a is, is kind of magnetic device that you use, like in the electric guitar, to, to capture the signal, and then you can amplify it. And uh, you can use it actually in any steel string instrument, like, like a bass or like the electric violin or whatever. And um, so he, these are the strings of the instrument here. And then you need uh, magnetic cores 
this kind of piece of paramagnetic material, and then you need the cord, so some wire uh, around the, the cords. And, and of course, that's how it's used. Like in, in guitar, this is a Stratocaster-like uh, guitar where you have here three lines of pickups, like the bridge, middle, and uh, neck pickup. And this is uh, here, this is another example. This is a Les Paul type uh, electric guitar where you usually just have two pickups. And these are so called humbucker pickups where you have two uh, lines of pickups next to each other. They are out of phase, so they cancel some hum. Uh, but there's a, these are like typical uses of, of, of those pickups. And uh, you use the principle of magnetic induction, and the physics department actually is, is in the Maxwell House, so I think everybody here knows much more about this, or at least there knows more, more about this topic than I do, but it uses the magnetic induction. So when the, when the string moves in the magnetic field, so here if you look at the string from the, from the end, and this is the, the core, when the string moves there, the, it changes the magnetic flux, and then this change, affects or, or causes or inducts like a current in the, in the wind or coil. And that's how you get the, the movement as an electric voltage out of the pickup. And then you can amplify it and play rock and roll or whatever. And we um, actually simulated that system, simple system where you have a magnetic core and then a string moving next to it. And we noticed that it's, uh, of course, it's easy to understand. It's very different whether if the if the string is moving towards the, the magnet or, or like um, above it, like in, hori in a horizontal direction. So this would be uh, the result of like a, a magnetic flux when you change the, change the, the, the string vibrates uh, towards the, uh, pick, uh, the magnet. So we can take this kind of exponential function. So the closer the, the string is moving, the larger the, the effect or, or current also the voltage and then if, if the string is moving uh, like horizontally above the magnet then it's closest to at the, at the middle so you get a lot of flux but then on both sides you get less so get this you know, symmetric bell like bell shaped curve which I, I think is actually quite well it's kind of obvious but it's quite interesting because that's a very hard like strong nonlinearity in fact and uh, we then uh, to simulate what happens, for example, if the string is made to move sinusoidally, so it's just a, a simple, simple uh, case. So in this case, this is the vertical uh, displacement of the string, so sinusoidal. And now, the, okay, the curves are sort of inverted, but now when when the string is close to the uh, magnet, you get uh, like the sin sine wave gets more more sharp. So let's get. It's amplified, and when it's far away, the sine wave gets uh, kind of uh, smoothed or rounded. And this causes uh, harmonic distortion to the signal, much of that actually. So you, instead of having just one harmonic, you'll get like a harmonic series like that, all harmonics. And then if, if the string is moving horizontally, you can see that for one period, you get actually two maxima. Any, any two maxima. Any time the, the string is close to the, in the middle, close to the magnet you get a peak and that happens twice in a period so you don't have the fundamental anymore actually we have here as, as a dashed line we have the spectrum of corresponding to that case so the fundamental is missing and then you have the second harmonic fourth harmonic sixth harmonic and so on so to see so you get this kind of distortion where you only produce even harmonics of the fundamental and of course in normal playing the, it's known that the guitar string actually is going around in a, in a wide way it wants to go like that it can't do just one uh, just move vertically, for example, it wants to go around. So we get a mixture of all that in, in real playing. But it means that you get a lot of uh, distortion. And then, of course, you get more from the, from the amplifier and, and the speaker. So it's all lots of distortion in, in guitar playing. But now this model actually means that now we can, uh, when we, uh, if we simulate these uh, curves, we can do uh, like a software version of a pickup nonlinearity to any any system, like an electric violin or a clavinet or whatever <coughs> instrument. And that was published in the Journal of the AES just last last uh, maybe December or not maybe quite recently. Okay, then something else. Um, another topic my team has been looking at is uh, how to do digital uh, subtractive synthesis. Subtractive synthesis is the principle of uh, analog 
analog synthesizers like Moog synthesizers of the 60s and 70s. And uh, the idea here is that uh, you use oscillators, which were original like kind of function generators that were used maybe for testing electronics like radios and TVs. And uh, you could do like get sawtooth waves or something like that. And then you have you detune usually these, so they are not in the same tune but slightly off or one octave apart, for example. And then you combine those signals. And then you use a filter. And the filter is interesting because then you get more lively uh, sound because that changes the spectrum of the thing. And then you also need at least two envelope generators. Envelope generators are uh, changing the like the gain over time so that you can get a soft attack in the sound, for example. And it, they can also control the use of the filter. So over time you can take change for some cutoff of the uh, filter or something like that. There's a little sound example here that just plays some typical subtractive synthesis sound, so you hear the bright sound of the synthesizer and how it evolves over time. So, like, very typical. But when you open the radio, you, 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 you hear something like that. That's actually one of the like uh, most popular categories of synthesizers nowadays. So everybody, everybody is using that in, at least in pop music nowadays. So the uh, oscillators, uh, so we have these kinds of various waveforms. With the sawtooth probably is the most common one of them. These are periodic waveforms, but they have a lot of rich spectrum, so lots of harmonics, that's the, that's the idea. And um, there are lots of harmonics because then you can use that filter to boost them or cut them. There must be enough material. But when you do a digital implementation, you get a problem which is called aliasing. Aliasing is a problem that uh, occurs when, when an analog signal has a very bright and, and wide spectrum, and then you use a finite sample rate to just pick samples, and uh, the spectrum gets folded. And I'll play, and this is an ugly sound, I have, don't want to play it too loud. This is a sawtooth that has been done so that we just uh, uh, sample this kind of ramp, so take the sample from the straight line, then jump up and, and, and again take them from the straight line. Well, it's actually not that loud after all. I wonder if you've heard any of the ugly effect. There's some extra in that sound. Actually, I don't think I hear any of that. <laughs> That's a that's not a great example then. We have to make it loud. So now it's ugly but you hear that there's some extra stuff. This is how it should sound. So this is made well, no no extra stuff. And people will probably think this is a new fire alarm or something. <laughs> <coughs> anyway. So that's the problem, so there will be some extra if you don't pay attention. And then, how to pay attention? That's the next, next thing, and we'll, we'll talk about that. <coughs> Actually, here's a little movie that also shows you how this aliasing happens. This is, uh, is, a, is a movie of the, of the spectrum of the signal, so you can see here like the, the harmonics, the first harmonic, second, and so on. And this other material here is, is aliasing. And when I play it, you'll, you'll see that uh, what happens. Oh, that's actually, it has to have to be so loud. These are the harmonics. And you can see that when they hit that end, they turn back. And this is called aliasing. So they get mirrored from the so called Nyquist frequency, which is this frequency here. So in this case, only three more left, and then the, four, the three, third, oops, it should go away, but it turns back. And so now it's stopped. And in this case also, only this, this is the fundamental, this is the second harmonic, and all the others are, are alias, these alias components, and we don't want to have them. And as you, as you probably saw, heard, sometimes it sounds like noise or something like that. It's, it's kind of distortion, but it can be very inharmonic. It can also go, be, go, uh, like go, go speeding because the harmonics and the alias components can be very close to each other, so you get, get something like pop, 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 pop. And then also you get an effect called heterodyne. So when your components are going up, uh, some other components are actually going down because the mirror images are going the other way. So they are detached from each other and you get like two different sounds. And you can also get the wrong, actually, this is an example for wrong fundamental because you actually perceive this fundamental here. Just 
because this frequency happens to be a special frequency. So many things can go wrong. Um, oops, sorry. <coughs> this is also an example of when things go right. Now, no alias I can see. This is done with so-called additive synthesis where you just produce the harmonics you want. So they go, they vanish when they reach the Nyquist, which is good. Uh, I'll show one method that helps here, and this is, this is a method called differentiated parabolic wave. It's, it's a very simple method, which I somehow uh, thought about some years ago. Um, this technique uses a modular counter, which is a basic, uh, basic sawtooth oscillator, so you count up and then you go down when you reach the, the like, threshold. And uh, what you do here is that you multiply the signal by themselves, you, you raise them to the second power, and this actually uh, is the same as, uh, as integrating the, the signal, the modulo counter signal. Because if you integrate a ramp like that, you get <coughs> t squared over 2, which is kind of like a parabola. And um, in next in this algorithm, you use a so called differentiator. Differentiator uh, basically just means that you um, compute a difference, like change local change in the signal. It's actually done so that you just take this sample and the previous sample and subtract. So it's a subtraction, but then you need a scaling, scaling because this operation, the subtraction actually makes signal very weak, so you have to scale. The scaling is proportional to sample rate and inversely proportional to your fundamental frequency, which actually is a little bit nasty. So in fact you need, it looks like you need a division in this algorithm, but you actually you only need it when you change the, uh, when you change the pitch. The, the fundamental frequency. That can happen often, but not every sample usually. And I'll play some of these uh, signals for you. This is the original uh, signal, which actually is the same as the trivial uh, sawtooth wave, but you just take the samples from a straight line, and it sounds horrible. Sorry about that. So that has all the, all the nasty extra uh, artifacts. And then now I have squared, squared the signal, so every sample here has been multiplied by itself. So everything is positive, and then you make this kind of, it looks actually quite happy, so a parabola smiling at you. And then it sounds much better also. And then finally, this is the difference version, so you just take the difference of each sample. So again, you have negative values and positive values. But there's a little change uh, at this uh, transition when you go from up, up uh, maximum to the minimum. And it sounds much better, actually. That's bad. Oops, this is not so bad. And uh, if you look at the spect spectra of these signals, we can see how and why it works. So here we have the spectrum of the original signal, and we, I have circled the harmonics. There's only eight, or maybe or, uh, actually seven of them in this mm -hmm. case. And uh, when I square the signal, the spectrum, uh, spe uh, Squaring or integration means that the signal gets low pass filter so that it, it, its spectral decay is, is uh, faster. So it's, it's, you get more 6 dB less energy per octave, actually. So instead of going here from 0 to minus 20 dB, you get for, go from 0 to minus 40 dB. And then when you differentiate the signal, it's basically just uh, it's a, it's a high pass filtering operation where the, the spectrum gets back to its original uh, slope. So again, you go from 0 to uh, but all these alias components don't come back. It's just those components that just get amplified a little bit. And that's why there's not that much aliasing. And that's a very simple method to get rid of a lot of the aliasing. Uh, we could also compare it. Maybe, maybe not actually. It sounds so bad. Let's not, let's not do it actually. You already know, I think. Um, if you can do sawtooth waves, you can actually do almost all waves, uh, waveforms. And this is an example of this show how you can do, uh, for example, rectangular pulse waves, for example, the square wave or, or any other pulse wave. You, you need two, or you can use two sawtooth generators with a, with a phase shift, and then you subtract them. Another idea is that you use just one, but then you uh, inverse comb filter them. So you take a copy and delay and then subtract. They are, these are equivalent, so it depends what you like to do. I can show why this uh, works. It's actually probably difficult to 
Think about it, but this is the original sawtooth, and this is a kind of shifted and inverted sawtooth, so it doesn't go up, but it goes always down, downwards. And then when you subtract these, it should be obvious that you get this kind of rectangular pulse. So there is a region when, when the decrease and increase kind of cancel each other, you get a constant, and then get some kind of transition, and then again, a flat area. So that's how you can do uh, all kinds of rectangular pulses. And now if you can clean this signal uh, from aliasing, then also this signal will be great. And there's also methods to do all, all other waveforms, uh, almost all period waveforms. Um, I'd also like to talk about a, a higher order extension of this idea, because actually this is also related to uh, Stefan, because when I pr presented first that method yeah. many years ago in a conference, Stefan asked, hey, could you, could you integrate more times and, and, and do even better than that? And I was like, no, I don't think so. I think it's impossible. But that's true. That's not true. Usually, if you say impossible, that's, that's wrong. It's not, it's not. Yeah, of course you could. I didn't realize, but, but yes, you can. Like if you, if you integrate a, like a linear function, you get a parabola. But if you integrate again, you have to be careful. In, in integration, you need these constants. And you actually need to assume an integration constant here. And then when you integrate, you actually, it's, it's, it's not just x to the power of 3, but there's something extra. So there will be extra terms every time. And if you do that correctly, then you can. I never thought of it. I, I just thought that you multiply one, one more time with, with, with x, but that doesn't work because you get a waveform that just shoots to the stars and never comes back. It's not good. It's not good. That's why I said impossible. That's not true. It works. And uh, also then if you want to go back to the sawtooth, you need to do more differencing. So you, you, you do more integrations, you do also <coughs> more of those differential operations. And here's examples. So the original trivial sawtooth, the happy uh, parabola, and then the third order curve. It now works because the cu cubic term goes up, but the linear term goes down, and they cancel, and, and it all stays. Uh, it's kind of zero, zero mean all the time. If you integrate one more time, you get this kind of unhappy uh, parabolic wave. Mm -hmm. Then more and more sinusoidal wave, actually, if you integrate one more time. And then again, it actually tends to go to a sine wave, I think. It's probably some kind of sine wave approximation, it turns out. Although that's not the purpose, but it seems to go like that. Uh, now I'm showing the differenced version. So I, I differenced like uh, once, twice, three times, four times, five times. And you can see that every time it gets kind of sort of way back. But the transition area is different. Actually, there's al always one more sample that tends to go uh, like smoother uh, in the transition region. We can also look at the spectra of these signals. So originally there's a lot of aliasing, then less, still less, 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 and, and, and almost no. And uh, of course, it looks like you should, you should do as many times as you want, uh, like can. But it turns out that actually it will be numerically impossible to do many, many, many integrations, unfortunately. The gain term in the, in the differentiation becomes really big and uh, like uh, there's no, not enough bits in the world to do much more than, than six integrations. Even I think, yes, I think even six integrations, the, like my MATLAB, accuracy of my MATLAB, which has 64 point uh, floating point numbers is not good enough. So, so I couldn't go further. Uh, I can also show this kind of sweep signal with the, this DPW integration uh, technique. This is just one integration and derivation. You can see, oops, well maybe you can't. It's my mouse. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't have to be so loud actually, but you can see that it particularly is, is good at low frequency, the attenuation of the signal error is very, very good at low frequency. It's not that interest, it doesn't do much at high frequency. These images still tend to bounce back from the night twist. But uh, it turns out that we are not that sensitive to that. We are, hearing is most sensitive around three kilohertz, so around this area, and also at very low frequency. So if you can wipe away all the, or at least attenuate the aliasing here, it, it, it should be good. And it looks like it's, it is. Uh, then, 
One of my uh, PhD students called Jari Kleimola who actually defended his uh, uh, dissertation just last week and, and did very well. He got this idea that you could even simplify the DPW method more. He actually compared like a trivial uh, sawtooth wave, it's uh, these little squares here, so these just go up, 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 and then back down and up, 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 like linearly. And this other curve of these dots are from, from the DPW algorithm, so you can see the uh, kind of rounded uh, transition. Uh, there's also kind of a shift in time, which I think we never paid much attention, but it actually turns out that it's, it's useful here. If you subtract these two signals, you will see how they differ from each other. Here it is, and it's interesting. It's almost like you just have a constant offset for most of the time, which is really trivial. You don't have to integrate and scale. You just shift, like, I mean add a constant. That's, that's nothing, like just one operation. And then in this transition region, that's more interesting, but this actually is a polynomial uh, like curve, which uh, Yari could, my, my student could derive. So all you, all you really have to do is that you add a constant offset, and then if in your inter-transition region, you actually cut the signal and replace it with a, with a polynomial. And that actually is more, more it's, it's simpler than anything else. And, and I think now I, I would like to suggest that if anybody must try, they should, they should try this technique, actually, not the integrations and their differencing methods. <coughs> uh, there is one more reason, actually, if you, if you do very quick changes of the uh, in the pitch, or the fundamental frequency of the signal, uh, the DPW algorithm also tends to ma make some transients, like some, some spikes in the signal, which we didn't notice in the beginning, but now we know. But this method doesn't do it, so we also get, got rid of that immediately. So it's, uh, it's more efficient, it's simpler, and uh, it doesn't have, doesn't produce artifacts. Otherwise, it's the same, it's the same method. Uh, I could also tell you about another technique that we have been thinking about also, actually, it was in, in, in invented by somebody called Eli Brand. He was a computer science student um, at Carnegie Mellon University uh, some 20 years ago. And he got an, another idea, uh, which now turns to be related, but he, he invented this function called BLEP, which is a bad limited step function. Like a step function means that you, you, you are at zero and then you go up and stay there forever. And that's uh, like a trivial uh, step function. But this is similar to those uh, transitions that you have in, in, in those geometric waveforms, like uh, in a square wave, or kind of discontinuity also in the, the same, same kind of discontinuity as you have in the sawtooth wave. And he realized that you could integrate the sync function. Sync function is a, is a well, it's the input response of a, of a low pass filter. If you integrate that, it will do actually this kind of nice, nice uh, waves and it, it produces a very smooth and nice transition. And then actually what you can do, you can subtract these two and, and get this uh, different signal only. And this is called uh, the left residual signal, which is kind of the difference of, of those two. And you could use this signal to, to correct transitions in waveforms like this. Like if here, here, this is like a square wave, a trivial square wave, it's like these sharp transitions. But if you then add these <coughs> reverse uh, shift it properly, because you can know where between the samples the, the change should be, you sample this kind of correction and add, you get these nice transitions. And this is seemingly quite a different method to do uh, alias cancellation. It just also rounds those uh, corners. But it turns out that this, I think, is the, exactly the same as this method. Interestingly, these many, many different things tend to be the same. Actually, I think your, your supervisor, Julius Smith, has said that everything, in the end, when you understand everything is equivalent to everything else, and usually it's equivalent to the sync function. And I think here, particularly, it turns out to be true. So, because it's all of these the somehow are the first law of single process. Yes, I think that's the first law. It's, it's kind of disappointing somehow, but, but it took years for us to realize that, again, this happens. Yeah. So, independently, we actually published this uh, about a year ago in, in the Journal of the American Acoustical Society of America. So, this method, this is called the polynomial black method, where you where you approximate with polynomials this uh, correction function. But now it looks like this is the same thing that, my, that I did in parallel with my, my student, and then they are the same. Very strange. 
And here are the polynomials, actually. So we can do them by integrating Lagrange polynomials. So Lagrange polynomials are polynomials that connect points uh, of data. So you can interpolate between data. So this would be kind of basis function for linear interpolation, where it's just connect dots. And this is the basis function for, for like parabolic interpolation, where you, where you draw nice uh, parabolic curves to connect points. And this is the cubic cubic polynomial. If you integrate and then get the residual, you get these functions. And these are those correction functions that you can use for, for doing that, that operation, alias suppression. Okay. So maybe then I would move on. Uh, I, I can also talk about uh, the filters, which are used in analog uh, synthesis. Uh, <coughs> Robert Moog, or Bob Moog, who in, invented the analog synthesizer, or at least the commercial version of it, uh, invented the digital, uh, invented an analog filter that you that can change the, the sound of a synthesizer in a nice way. And uh, actually, my student called Antti Vuovilainen, he, he <coughs> about ten years ago he invented a way to do a digital model of that uh, that filter. The filter of this is actually here. Uh, inside these boxes, you have this kind of digital filter. It's just a first order digital filter, basically. It's not, not anything great. Then you also need uh, an, a nonlinear function, which here is a hyperbolic tangent function. So when the signal goes in, it go first goes through this kind of saturating nonlinearity, then through these filter stages, and then out. But then there's also a feedback loop. And in the feedback loop, we, uh, in this version, you need a, an extra delay. Actually, in an analog system, you don't want to have delay in a feedback, but in digital systems, you need to have it. Uh, let's say it's not impossible to implement it without delay, but it's complicated. But yes, you can, if you like. Some people like to do it, but we didn't want. And then there's some scaling going on here. But basically, it's just a feedback loop with four first order filters. And uh, this together actually makes a resonant low pass, which is very useful in music. You'll, you'll see. And then there is this nonlinearity, which uh, can uh, do some distortion or compression. Of the sound. It's also interesting that uh, in that previous figure you have these, you can, you can take these intermediate uh, signals between the filtering stages and multiply them with, with coefficient A, B, C, D, E. Usually, I think uh, all of these would be zero from A to D, and, and only E would be one, and that would be your filter. But if you, if you change the filters, uh, for example, you just uh, select one output in the middle by setting C to one, just here, just listen to that output, you actually get a second order low pass, not a fourth order low pass. And you could also get like a band pass filter if you, if you combine some of the outputs, and you can also get a high pass. It turns out that this one structure becomes your universal filter, musical filter, you can do well, almost everything that people usually want to do with filters, which I think is quite interesting. And this is an old trick that we actually, or my, my student actually read from from an old manual of a synthesizer, an Ober Oberheim synthesizer, which was somebody just scanned and put on the web. Otherwise, we would never know about this, but it worked. This trick worked in, in an Oberheim synthesizer back in the 80s, maybe. But it also works in this structure. Strange. And uh, this filter is nice because uh, basically the cutoff, so where, you, where the signal is, uh, what is your highest frequency that you want to pass, uh, through the filter and the Q value, which is the sharpness of the resonance, these are more or less independent of each other. And I can show you a little movie here. We, we are just uh, filtering white noise and uh, moving uh, the, the resonance frequency, and you'll see that it's, it's fairly neat. There's also a sound here, I think. Yeah. You can see that on a low scale, the, the shape of the peak is constant. <coughs> Almost. <laughs> in the end it's not, but, <coughs> but in the beginning it is. But that's at very high frequency, so we can try again. Look how nice. Yeah. Yeah. We're hoping that, uh, that those high frequencies, mo nobody cares. But of course it means that there's some room for improvement if somebody wants to still play, play with this. Um, and th there's also a spectrogram figure that shows you that this uh, red, the peak area, stays approximately the same, but not in the end. 
Um, uh, this filter also does something that's called self-oscillation. This is a well-known phenomenon in analog filters that if you make the, um, if the Q value, the, the sharpness of the uh, resonance is very, very, if it is very sharp, so the Q is very high, uh, the filter starts to sing. So you don't have to even play anything and, and you can just change the kind of uh, frequency and like, like it, it whistles. And we tried whether it works. So we set the resonance to one, which means that uh, there's no loss in the feedback. So it's critically like, well, it's basically it's not a filter, it's, it's an oscillator. And we can, we'll, find, I think this is very loud. Let's see what happens. No, nothing again. Okay, that's what happens again. And actually, it doesn't really work. It, it works for some time, but it fades away. But actually, this also is because we, we never thought in the beginning uh, and during this, when we did these examples, that you could actually also make the resonance more, uh, or feedback gain more uh, larger than one. Usually, you can't, but now you can, because there is this nonlinearity, the saturating nonlinearity in the loop, remember? Maybe I can go back. So we can see that this, this saturating nonlinearity softly keeps everything. Uh, bounded. So whenever you put in big numbers, they will get become small numbers here. Because this nonlinearity, the hyperbolic tangent, will, will, it's not clipping, but it will compress everything. And that's why you could also do like a larger, uh, larger values, uh, feedback values. And uh, we actually ne never tried it, but, but I, well, well, actually later we tried it. And it, yes, then you can actually make it sing. So now you can do that. But it doesn't work as well as in an analog system. That's also another thing somebody could try to fix, I think. It should, should really work like in an analog filter. And uh, finally, I just have some examples to show how you can use that filter. So my students uh, just uh, took a synthesizer sound chord and uh, pro pro uh, like changed it with this filter. Let's hear. So it's an analog synthesizer sound. But now, when you change the, the cutoff actually of the filter with the LFO, it sounds more interesting. And you know what? It's not actually used only for, for making music like that, but actually, it's all, you can also uh, filter anything with that filter because it's a filter and anything can go in and it's used a lot in music and my students also tried that so there's there's their test signal and so on I think I'll just oops let's just uh, make it a little bit louder but now they they try to be music producers with, with MATLAB and this is what they get, get out you can become a music producer with <coughs> MATLAB. So it's just basically <coughs> sweep one parameter like from zero to a big number. Yes, nice. Yeah, and I, that's actually a big, like, I think very important use of that filter really in, in music production. There's plugins for many, many systems where you do just that. Mm -hmm. um, if I have a few moments, I could also tell you about Little, uh, project we did some years ago. We did. We worked with a company called VLSI Solution, which is a Finnish company doing uh, chips for uh, mobile devices. And uh, yeah, it's that kind of little chip. You can put it in a phone. I think they never got so far because some other big companies dominate that area. But there were some games and, and toys where you could put this audio processor. So you can make like a teddy bear sing or like uh, some games, like board games, make some sounds and things like that. And um, so we used uh, those days uh, a simple version of M MIDI. MIDI is the protocol to, to, to play sound with, with uh, synthesizers and, and computers, and, and, and it was very simplified. And we actually <coughs> designed that those days that we would use digital subtractive synthesis because, mainly because there was not much uh, memory on that chip. So you couldn't basically do 
big synthesizers, the way you do is you sample nice sounds and so on. And uh, so we used actually something very similar to the DBW algorithm for oscillators, and then we used that, uh, or not actually not the same old filter, but another filter by my student for filtering, and then did all kinds of sounds. We had to do many sound sets, like many drum sets, and, and all, all sounds that you get from synthesizers, pianos and flutes and, and brass instruments and everything. And um, here's some examples of what, what happened. So basically that chip is not, it's not a synthesizer, but it's like a, it's a music player, a MIDI player, so it's in, put inside your to device, like a toy, and then if, if, if you give it a MIDI file, it plays. But you can't adjust anything, nothing. So everything has to work. In, 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 in music production, of course, you could change, like if you don't like the drum sound, you just change. But now you can't because it's all coded in the MIDI. MIDI file and uh, here's some examples uh, or at least one play one example where it just everything was frozen and it was already done and then we download it from the web lots of MIDI files and just hoped that they would sound great. Okay, so somebody did the James Bond thing. It's not that bad. Even the bass seems to work. Yeah. Luckily. Even the mix is, is automatic, so you can't do anything. So, it's just that ha what happens. Okay, that's a little strange. Anyway, yeah, but that's, that's, that's how it was. So, and, and like ringtones used to be like, polyphonic ringtones were like this also. This is basically how poly polyphonic ringtones were done, are, are still done. Nobody develops that any that like technology anymore because it's dying dying technology, everybody's using music files nowadays, but like ten years ago they started doing this thing and uh, actually I think it was the like the golden age also for for music synthesis because there were so many people oh, there are still so many people who are using music synthesis in the they, they might have two in the, like I have two in my pockets, <laughs> two phones. But uh but uh, of course, many even didn't even think about it. But now, now it's it's going away, unfortunately. Okay, I think I'm I'm going to stop soon. So these are some references. Uh, I can give these slides to to Stefan. You can if you want to deliver them. You can, you can do that. So they, these are some papers we I put up this with my colleagues and students during the recent years about analog, virtual analog synthesis. These are some references of spring reverberation, reverberation. Also Stefan's paper because Stefan was previously the, or supervising the master's work of my, my student Julian. Julian who was an uh, AMT, uh, yeah. Zig Tech student. <laughs> Maybe some of you remember yeah. Julian. Julian is now in Finland. So soon he will finish his, or uh, defend his, his PhD thesis, which will be uh, part mainly about string reverb emulation. And then there's some other references like this, uh, like the, the paper about uh, Acoustics and modeling of pickups, guitar pickups. Actually, okay, October, not November, December, but October. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, do we have any questions for uh, for Lisa? Uh, Ask a question. Yes. yes. Uh, you talked about the spring reverb at the start. And if mm -hmm. I understood correctly, you model the spring reverb using a big finite yeah. difference time domain, and what you've been modeling with is not. That's true, it's a different approach, yeah, that's right. So, how do the two, how do they sound? Do they sound comparable? I mean, what I'm wanting to do is get like a bit of a fight going. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'll voluntarily throw that fight because it's, uh, I mean, it, it's faster to do things with uh, it all has much faster. Um, is there any way you can compare how, you know, like, a, I, I would say that in, in at least in theory you could be better here right because final difference could be more accurate you could really solve how, yeah. how everything works in theory but in order yeah. to really get it to sound we have to go pretty high and yeah right whereas you're was that operating at an audio rate or low pass? Yeah, I think that's I think that operates at audio rate. Yeah, forty four kilohertz. Yes, that's right. We don't have to oversample, and uh, because it's a filter based system, like a fit, fit loop with filters, we can we can quite freely put some more filters and some modulations. If it's kind of kind of <coughs> like 
easy to tweak, tweak it, yeah, and do all kinds of things. While in FDTD, I think there's certain rules you have to obey, and you can't just freely yeah. just shake yeah. everything, for example. That's tricky. Yeah. yeah. They do different approaches. And actually, last night we talked about there no might or earlier today that there might be other approaches how to how to approach this problem yeah, also. Maybe using modes or something. Modes? Like, you know, way there's lots of modes people. in that si yes, there's lots of them in this system, but you could I, at least in principle, yes. Great questions? Do, do you know why um, that, why yeah. did that oh. Yeah, go ahead. No. Yeah. You know the, the mode filter design that you showed, is that the most obvious way that you would come upon if you were an analog designer to, to design a uh, resonant filter like that? If I were an analog designer? Yeah, if you were... No, I, I, don't think it's, I don't think so at all. I think, I think people say it's, it's quite, a, quite a strange like yeah. uh, circuit. They call it the la la like yeah, right. transistor ladder. It's, it's, a, it's a strange looking circuit. I don't know much about analog design, however, but but I, I think everybody thinks it's very strange. But the benefit is that the, you, you kind of keep the, um, the bandwidth stays relatively constant as you sweep it. Is that yes. It? And that's characteristic of that particular design. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, it's great. Oh, okay. Yes. Right. It, it's a great design, yeah. It's the most famous analog filter used in music technology. I think. Yeah. When you're running those, is there, do you run into aliasing yes. issues too? So are those yeah. oversampled then? Yeah, you, uh, yeah, you usually yeah. oversample it by a factor two at least, yeah, because of the non-linearity. Otherwise, sometimes you get aliasing, yeah. so you don't. It's not good. And just the last thing on that, when you put the unit delay in, mm. what happens actually? I mean, yes, so it actually ruins everything. Yeah, it actually after that your yeah after that your cutoff and uh, resonance are not independent anymore. So actually, we we need to cheat. We need to, uh, we need to correct uh, like all all coefficients of the filter. So when we when we yeah, when we change the cutoff, we also need to change the coefficients that are related to, to the Q and, and vice versa. So there, is a, there, are, there are some correction polynomials order for, unfortunately. Is that, is that audible? Uh, yeah. I think it would be without, well, it's just that uh, you, you would like, like if, you, if you set your cutoff to like two kilohertz, you would like it to be there without the, the change. Uh, oh, it would, yeah, it would still go to two kilohertz. Yeah, but, but it's just that your Q would go funny. So yeah. it would not remain the same. Mm. So it would not behave the way you expect. Oh, actually, yes, it's also, yeah, probably it's also the other way around. So if you change the Q, I think your cutoff might change. That's bad, <laughs> I think. That's well, I just bad. wonder if it really, if it, I mean, I don't know how normally how far up that cutoff goes in a real Moog unit. I mean, probably not too far up, right? No, actually, how mean, far? Quite, quite, far, quite high, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, like above. Yeah. Yes, bro. Oh, okay. I that think. Yeah. Yeah. Not sure. Think, yeah. Yeah, but it's 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 not it's not perfect like that. It's it's not perfect at all. Mm. So, I think there's you could you could make a better model. Yeah. But there was another question there. I don't know. I was just interested when we were doing. Uh, you showed the first demo of the spring reverb in uh, Max MSP. Yeah. Did you go back to developing that as like you developing in MATLAB first and then? You know, creating as a max MSP external, and then like I was just wondering like how we did, how we, yeah we first played a lot with the MATLAB model, but I think that was I think Julian just did that in Ma in Max like that I don't think it was con converted like but he just just built a new new version in or was that what you what was your question? Oh um, no, I was just wondering, you know, like, because uh, sort of like I know there's like sort of issues where like most of the times if you're doing things in physical modeling, mm -hmm. you have to do it as like writing as an external because Max doesn't go sample by sample. Oh, I mean that. Okay. Oh, oh, how do you do it? Actually, actually, that I think this is not a. The delays are big. I think that's not an issue here. Ah, so you can just the delays are really big. So you don't, the feedback is not like instant or anything. It's, it's yeah. actually huge. I, I think see. you can do. You can assume so, uh, accept some kind of like buffers, then feedback. Ah, for cool, example. Cool. Yeah. So you can just do it like straight and match and have to go into like coding any. Yeah, you know, I don't think you have to do any anything tricky there. I, I think yeah. mm. I'd be wrong, but I think so.
Okay, There's a, a quick question about the uh, nonlinearity of the pickup. So yeah. you were modeling that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is that actually, I mean, how significant is that inherent nonlinearity compared to the distortion which uh, guitarists normally put in? Uh, Probably it's not that significant, of course, but the thing is, it's always there. So because it depends on the geometry of the of the magnet and, and the height of the strings. So once everything's fixed, it's always there, and you can't change. So it's there. So all we have, even if you have, if you listen to the clean sound without uh, yeah, yeah, like it's always the same. Uh, yeah, it's always there, and of course that's it's interesting, it's strange. So we have to use some other transducer to to get the sound of the string without yeah. that distortion. Yeah. We are also like shocked to see how what, like strong nonlinearity. It's not a big nonlinearity because it's, it's a strong one. Yeah. Yeah. So the harmonies that are generated are, are strong. Yeah. So it's uh, not something you can neglect. Uh, uh, some years ago we were just playing around with uh, an infrared optical sensor. Yeah. Also, well, the same thing happens. Yeah. Of course. If it goes horizontally, you know, again, you've got the kind of symmetrical Mm -hmm. uh, also with the picture, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Does your, your string model you're using, does that uh, change its polarization over time? Well, as well we can do it, yeah, we can, we can so change if you like, but we can just mix the signals yeah. at the end of the string so that we let right. the, yeah. the polarization to lead to each other so that there's, like, like in a, well, kind of, in, like in a real <coughs> string where, yeah. But of course, we also don't even know how the two polarizations are really coupled, I think. They're probably at least coupled at the ends of the string, but maybe there might be some other things, mm -hmm. like if there's any tor torsional forces in the string yeah. itself, and it, so it wants to, like, mm -hmm. a pulse going on all over the string doesn't want to go straight, but it wants to, like, go like that, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't think anybody knows. We're actually going to look at that. We have now, uh, we also have, like, purchased like, op that's an optical sensor. We are going to look at the string from two different directions and see what, how it behaves. It seems like it's almost impossible to keep it in one plane. I think so too, after all, yeah. In, in the beginning, I always thought that you could try to plug it in one direction and see what happens, but it, you can't. Yeah. The minute, if you do it in something, it just <laughs> start going in circles, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Any last questions? Okay. Thanks for coming. Thanks.